generally about climate change and clean energy law and policy in Hawaii. This is, uh, I promise all of you that I'm going to change this presentation to a PDF and, and give it to you all on your jump drives if you want it, because I'm not going to get through it. I know it for a fact. I never usually do, but, um, but there's too much going on in, in the law and policy of it. And really, actually, um, following Chair Isla's lead, after hearing this morning's panel, I just had to change what I was going to talk about. I mean, there was just so much that I was inspired by. And, um, and I wanted to make kind of a bigger point that I think attaches to what we were hearing this morning in particular. And one is that um, a lot of people see the law of climate change um, probably just as sort of the black letter. And it can be quite um, boring, <laughs> frankly. Frankly, what we're doing is trying to get laws going and energy and adaptation to facilitate these things. But we're not also recognizing that in the law, there's a possibility that we're aggravating the impacts of climate change. And it couldn't be any more true than in the context of Hawaii. And so I really want to leave at uh, the end of my 10 minutes with that sort of sense that what are the feedbacks, the legal feedbacks that we're going to see uh, that exacerbate the experience of climate change? And I think, Kapoor, your, your talk this morning, um, to give a shout to the Richardson <laughs> faculty member, what it does, though, is show that when we have this tension between uh, property rights, for example, and our, our attempts to uh, introduce in indigenous uh, ways of governance, there's a disconnect, and if we don't affect the sort of the governing principles behind the law that, go that governs the inclusion of that indigenous policy, then it doesn't work, or it only goes so far. You get these ad hoc measures that benefit, but over the long term, we don't see that real change that we need, and the sort of greasing the wheels for the kinds of adaptation that we need that's appropriate here in Hawaii. And this is true in, in other places as well. And so I think we have to have a, a, a larger conversation about what the role of the law is, both in the direction we're heading, but also what we have on the books right now that are just kind of hanging us up, right? So, um, so what I'm going to do, <laughs> eight minutes, legal feedbacks, <laughs> mitigation measures, that's a reduction of, of, um, of greenhouse gas emissions from our state. We only have about 0.3% of contribution in the U.S. This is not to say it's insignificant, this is really just to sort of suggest that we're part of a, the reasons why we might do mitigation measures will involve a number of other uh, benefits that we will experience as a result of them. Um, adaptation measures, I'm basically going to talk about um, some county work that's happening and really just give another shout out to the Water Initiative as an adaptation measure at the state level that's important and just talk a little bit about ICAP adaptation studies, which I won't have time for, but if I do. <laughs> okay, the problem with legal feedback and that mechanisms, this is what I was talking about. This is actually um, what I think is a groundbreaking thesis that David Karen had come up with in 1990. This was well before the conversation about climate change really hit any discourse, much less the legal discourse. But he was talking about it with respect to the uh, law of baselines. And in particular for um, our island neighbors in the, in the Pacific, in the Western Pacific. We have a series of laws that govern the rights that you have to uh, all, of the, uh, all of the precious resources in the near shore and, and outer zones of, of the water, right, of your water, of the, of the oceans. And because we've just sort of created this elaborate infrastructure to organize that, we're, there was this moment in time, we're still seeing it, where already stressed communities are having to do an exceptional amount of uh, sort of legal gymnastics to hold on to those rights. And he was saying, this is foolish, and this is a feedback. Um, and to excerpt very quickly from one of, the, one of his, um, I think, very um, striking uh, uh, sections of this, this article, he says, legal feedbacks will not alter the amount of climate change, but will aggravate the suffering that will accompany such change. The greater the change, the greater the aggravation. I'm just going to put a quick footnote on the first clause, which is to say that because of our inaction, actually, at the international level, we are actually aggravating climate change, right? The absence of law at the international level is aggravating climate change. So we are going to see more of it, I think, as a result of sort of legal um, foot dragging. But we're also seeing that in the attempts to adapt, there's an aggravation of that change, right? And there's, there's going to be greater, greater impacts that we'll have to deal with. So to get to the law and policy in Hawaii, this is the super tanker image. I think it's very striking. I do climate justice work, so I see this obviously as um, an important issue of where we get our energy from, but it's also a justice issue where we refine this oil, the pollution um, that we, we uh, introduce to certain communities when we burn it. Um, this is a really important uh, source of, um, I think, important governance efforts that we need to do 
with a, a mind to the, the people that are most impacted. I also think it's a matter of long-term planning. I'm from Jamaica originally, I say this to my fellow Jamaicans. Um, when the oil is at its last few drops, we will not be the first on the list, right, to get it. Um, this is something Hawaii needs to be thinking about as well. And so, um, um, we, uh, we have a, a, an opportunity here. Climate change isn't happening in a vacuum, it's happening in the context of serious resource scarcity. What do we see happening in Hawaii, though? The barrels of oil that's imported annually um, went down in 2009 largely because of price, but are, it's increasing. This is an issue. Well, we are, for good news, one of the 26 or so states that have introduced um, greenhouse gas emissions caps, right? Um, we are actually the second. New Jersey will try to claim that title, but we actually are the second after California, and we modeled our Act 234 after the Global Warming Solutions Act out of California, and what it was meant to do was reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, read, reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, and things like super tankers that we saw. So we passed Act 234 with the purpose of saving our precious environment. We wanted to cap state emissions at the 1990 levels by 2020. These are somewhat arbitrary numbers, but are seen throughout um, policy from the international to the more state uh, scale. We established a greenhouse gas emissions reduction task force that was tasked with giving emissions inventory, but was also tasked with uh, advising the Department of Health on rulemaking for how we can get to, to that goal of 1990 by 2020. And um, the DOH was meant to to uh, promulgate those rules and have them be on the books by January 1st of this year, guess what? Didn't happen, but thankfully we do have draft rules. And uh, I think a very committed office to get us to where we need to go in terms of these greenhouse gas state rules. Um, what does it mean on the ground? Well, about 25 entities will be specifically affected that are, that are permitted um, at the DOH through the Air Pollution Control Act. But uh, it's in terms of sort of price differences, those sorts of things, it's not bearing out as having a major impact on the everyday person. Um, what it also does, though, is acknowledge the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative. This is one of the um, major uh, recommendations coming out of the Greenhouse, Greenhouse Gas Emissions Reduction Task Force, um, was to support this Clean Energy Initiative because it was an attempt to pull together a diverse amount of um, energy-related measures to get us down uh, to a reduced reliance on fossil fuels. One of the, um, in its first year after the, the, the agreement between the Department of Energy and the state, there were a number of clean energy goals that were introduced, Act 155, uh, with our renewable electricity portfolio standards. There was 156 on clean energy vehicles, other tax credits related to renewable energy, and importantly, um, all are important, but probably the most important in some ways was the tax on imported oil or the barrel fee. Right? And the barrel fee actually was meant to uh, introduce more monies into adaptation measures that we want to see happening throughout the state as it relates to food and natural resource management. There's also the, green, um, the clean energy goals of last year uh, that, were, that included investigation of novel ideas like on-bill financing, which would help uh, the residents and individuals have access to these frankly, now still expensive renewable energy alternatives. Um, it also allowed for the Public Utilities Commission to think about what we mean by a benefit. Is it just a monetary benefit to have this change occur, or are there other benefits that we can fold into the equation when we're thinking about how best to prepare ourselves for wow, two minutes, okay. How are we doing? Um, annual electricity use, this was business as usual, project, projected well into to 2030. Um, this is where we would have been with the efficiency and renewable standards that we were um, that were projected to reduce our emissions uh, by 70% by 2030 and remaining fossil fuel. I want to note that this is actually a pretty aggressive measure, but of course we still would rely 60% on fuel, fossil fuel, so it's not perfect. But we're actually doing pretty well um, with respect to electricity. We see statewide use down. We see our consumption for electricity generation down. We see a, a small but diversified and a growing renewable energy source. So good news, right? But uh, you may remember one of the earlier slides said that we had oil uh, barrels increasing. Well, how'd you get here this morning? Part of the issue is uh, transportation, liquid fuels. And some of what we're seeing is the annual gasoline consumption statewide is increasing. Okay, so um, we could rely on everyone getting a leaf, 
which is a great car, I love mine, uh, but it's not Linus, especially from a justice perspective, that's a silver bullet. It's not an answer at this point. Um, we need to be thinking about what's coming up in terms of legislation over the next uh, year. And no matter what you feel about these particular bills, it's important that you're at the table versus on the table. What are we going to, what is this position on, um, on how we at least have the conversation about the undersea cable, for example? or how we roll out um, energy efficiency support in uh, communities that are underserved right now. Um, in terms of adaptation, we see that there's a clear need for adapting. Um, Chip Fletcher talked more about what the impacts are. We need to, to see more happening at the state of Hawaii. Unlike the map at the beginning of the talk, in this map, Hawaii's action in terms of adaptation planning is conspicuously absent. There have been false starts on this with the climate change task force that was formed but never funded. And now we're seeing a lot of ad hoc measures from very well-meaning divisions that's not coordinated at this point. Um, and we need to see more of that. At the county level, setback policies will be doing some of the work in terms of sea level rise um, planning. Uh, and the ordinances in Kauai and Maui are of the most progressive, not only in the state but in the country, especially Kauai. And we've seen attempts to at least frame out what we need in terms of adaptation planning in the state, um, which uh, the Office of Planning and ICAP worked on to get the step-by-step -step process at least um, uh, written down. ICAP has also done a number of studies on how best to adapt. I, there are a number of possibilities that are in these documents. We really try to investigate all the pol possible policy tools that could be used that are on the books, some that are novel that could be introduced. But uh, what I really want to share with you is that when we look at these recommendations, and again, I'll give you the PDF so you can look more closely, there's myriad tools, but does it fit here in Hawaii? Is it, is it synchronous with the larger you know, sort of policy um, limitations that we have? Uh, does it reflect what the community wants? The, there are possibilities, but we need to continue to have that conversation. In water resources, we see that the legal descendant of the Hawaiian Kingdom is, is the public trust doctrine. It works here in a way that it doesn't work in any other state in the US because of the history of Hawaii. How do we allow for that to actually flourish considering the limitations that our uh, sort of legal structure imposes on us in preparing? So I want us to, to sort of think about um, how we think about policy and how we think about adaptation planning. Certainly there are specifics we can do in terms of assessment and planning and mainstreaming in the conversation, but what that means in terms of overall policy cohesion and empowering the Native Hawaiian community is going to be altogether something different, and that's what we need to have a conversation about, um, uh, and that would be my parting, my parting thought. Thank you so much.